Hey ho, Avi the vlogger here. It is wintry and I am drinking some chocolate tea. And it's not only a chocolate rooibos tea, it's a tea I put, but I fixed it like hot chocolate. I put in cocoa and cinnamon and nutmeg and some cayenne pepper. And because I was planning a light breakfast of warm cereal, I put in like you would do with coffee. Um, and in some places they do that with tea too. I put in a pat of butter. So I've got a really rich, warm, lovely, hot cocoa tea I'm going to drink while I sit and talk about things. So in my last video, or one of my last videos, the bad kind of burnout maintenance, I was talking about how we maintain our burnout and how sometimes environment and society at large maintain our burnout by keeping us in a state of burnout so that it just kind of never goes away. Because I think sometimes it sounds like it's just this mental affect, something, or effect. My words are loopy today, but I'll try to be understandable. Something that just takes place where, as neurodivergent individuals, we end up burnt out, which is somewhat like a depression. I always called it depression light. And that was my experience because the depression I was in was really intense. That doesn't mean it would be light for somebody else. That means that was the comparison for what I had experienced. It sometimes sounds when you're reading about it and you're listening to it, whether it's fully pathologized or not, as if a burnout happens and just magically stays for no apparent reason. And there are reasons why it's happening. It happens for a reason. It's an effect of something. There's a cause and it leads to this effect. And the reason why it tends to stay put is because something is causing it to stay put. In my experience and from what I am gathering from my years of research into the neurodivergent community, you don't get burnt out and then never come out of it or stay in it for a year or multiple years just because you got burnt out in the first place. It's not that the event that happened was that big per se. And it's not that there's something about your brain that just won't fight it off. Frankly, I can speak from my autistic brain fighting things off. We seem to kind of automatically know what we need a good amount of the time. When the rest of the world is telling us that we're not hearing that noise and we're not seeing that phase of lights and colors and things, whatever's bugging us, we know we're seeing it and our brain is telling us to stop seeing it because it's bugging us and we can't deal. So we kind of automatically know what to do a good amount of the time. And on top of that, the human brain is just kind of built to heal. The human body is built to heal. Every time something happens, whether it's an accident, you, you end up injuring yourself by accident, or you decide, I want to get a huge tattoo, and so the injury is taking place on purpose, we're doing these things knowing that everything is going to heal. Sometimes we do things emotionally. Sometimes we end relationships. Sometimes we stay in relationships, and it causes us injury, but some part of us knows that somehow we'll go on or we'll heal. We might give up something. We might sacrifice something for somebody we love. We might, whatever the choices we're making, we're doing it because we know the human as a whole creature, as a holistic being, we are going to heal. This is what I'm trying to say. We're going to heal holistically. Again, if my words are coming out weird, I'll try to be understanding. So on the subject of this neurodivergent burnout phase, it doesn't just go away without anything helping it. And it doesn't just stay without anything triggering it. It's as fluid as it would be for anybody else, neurotypical or otherwise. I'm sitting here learning how to deal with my own brain. I spent years doing everything I could to study autism and to study it from the actually autistic community so that I could relate and learn what might help me. Because it had been decades of life without information. There's psychology to be studied, but let's not get it twisted. It is neurotypical psychology. 
And it is often in antithesis to whatever it is that's working for me or naturally natural to me. So I'm studying psychology and I'm learning about myself and it's telling mm -hmm. battery died. I'm being shady while I'm trying to film myself to YouTubing fame. What? No. Forget you, you are dismissed today. But I'm gonna have my tea and we're gonna chat. Because I have started to realize that there are some things that I go to, whether I'm realizing it or not, when I'm in burnout. So, top five things, and I'm going to be looking at my list, because I'm still in burnout, and my brain is doing a thing. So, I'm going to glance down a lot, and I'm checking my list for facts and memories. Okay, so thing number one, this is going to be so much fun for some of those oddies, okay? I'm speaking from oddie... ADHD, so I'll call it Audi HD. Eventually I'll stop doing the announce that that's what it is, but I don't know how many people know about this. I thought it was well known, and a lot of people don't. So if I'm like Audi HD, that's Al, AU, autism, plus DHD, ADHD. Some of us are going to love this tip. Tip number one cut people off. <laughs> now, this is the kind of thing I know you can't necessarily do all the time. It's going to end up taking place wherever you can do it. It ends up taking place wherever I can do it. Um, cutting people off basically means I'm exhausted. Social interaction is too much. People are talking about things. Maybe it's what they're talking about. Maybe it's the people they are. And whatever the case, and to whatever degree necessary, which is generally just about 100%, I will turn my ringer off. I live with my phone on do not disturb so those who get through are individuals who are chosen to get through because just in general I kind of need that rest so that's a personal boundary that I have in general and when it's in burnout it will get to the point where when I'm in burnout it will get to the point where I will just go ahead and make sure that no one can get through especially so that I can sleep I will make sure that when I am actually able to sleep and it's my time to sleep, you know, if I get that thought that that friend who seldom calls but I like talking to might call while I'm asleep and I feel the misery of having to wake up and make that decision and decide what to do in the situation, I'm going to go ahead and shut that off. So that call, if it comes through, I'll get back to you later. And God have mercy on the mind, going crazy, thinking about all the potential situations. Um, I travel a lot on instinct, so you got to travel on your instinct and do what's comfortable for you. I know the concept of missing a call could seem like, I mean, just total anathema. I mean, how horrific, you don't know what's going on. For me, it's always going to get to a point where it's just very much worth it. And so I'm 100% going to do that when I need to sleep. It's pretty much going off. A good amount of the time, I'll just power the phone down. Um, I try to make sure I keep it away from me anyway, but specifically burnout, phone calls, messages, social media interactions and reactions and things like that, it's getting put off until the next day or at least until I know I'm able to handle it. I can get my words together, um, feeling like I'm stumbling over my words right now, but I'm relying on my personal inherent nature to just talk, 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 so I know those words will come out even when I'm nervous. That's why I'm able to even film this video right now. So I guess I should add myself to that list because if I'm really burnt out and I don't think I can get my words together, I will cut myself off and decide I'm not filming any videos. You can take a look at the past month of zero uploads on my station if you don't believe me. Sometimes that happens. I'll cut myself off and decide I'm not answering my own requests to engage on social media, <laughs> to make videos, to call or contact people. It's basically going out the window. So that's it. Tip number one, cut people off. Tip number two is going to be related to this. It's like an adjunct in a way, but I think it's an entirely different category because we can't all cut people off. We can't all get everybody out of our days or start receiving messages for whatever reasons. We might have obligations. So I'm looking at my list. 
and it says when I have to have contact with people I allow myself to have meltdowns so tip number two might just be have a meltdown have a strategic meltdown like uh, that old joke from television programs where somebody is in a bad situation and suddenly they run away you're gonna run away hmm. mm -hmm. I'm going to buy a much larger SD card I was trying to say we're going to run away but we're going to market it as a tactical retreat so in this case if you have to deal with people, when I have to deal with people, this is what I do. I allow myself to have the naturally occurring meltdowns. Now, this is going to be, I mean, it's going to hinge upon your experience with meltdowns, how you feel about them. I'm closing a drawer. It's in my way. I'll hurt myself. Closed it with my foot. It's over now. The noise is done. It's going to have to so much to do with whether you want to do this and what I am suggesting I'm calling a tactical retreat because you are going to tactically remove yourself from an unsafe situation and get to what I'm suggesting if you were to use your judgment and do it is that you find a safe location where you are alone and or with the safest person an actual safe person if the safest person you know isn't safe, I know how that is, don't pick them. I wouldn't. Safe, alone, in a place where you can contain yourself. I happen to have the upside of being able to have my meltdowns in a room where I have a punching bag, a training bag, and I bought punching gloves. And I try to mostly only use the bag with the gloves. That thing helps me a lot. It helps me when I'm being run into a meltdown. It helps me when I'm having the meltdown. I will lay the sucker. It usually sits upright like this. I will lay it down on the ground and straddle it and punch it from all sides in order to get that energy out. And that thing is a lifesaver for me. Ah, my gosh, I love it so much. I don't even know how to express. I bought it when I was in a deep state of being triggered and intentionally triggered it made a difference it made a huge difference i wanted one all my life but that day i knew i needed it oh my word i got it that day so i'm suggesting that if you do anything like i do you're going to think about where you are and what your personal repercussions will be for deciding that you want to have a meltdown and it's not like having a meltdown is a choice, but I know that we try to contain it. We try to push it aside and rather than sort of delaying it or eliminating it, often what we're doing is just turning that energy back in on ourselves. So instead of going out into the atmosphere, it's just destroying us from the inside. So I allow myself to have those meltdowns when I have to be around people in situations that trigger them whether it's, we're not talking about the people's responsibility or whether they're intentionally triggering or anything, carelessness, we're not talking about people who care greatly but don't know what they're doing or saying. I'm just saying whatever the situation is, however it's working for you, when it's happening to me, I let myself have that release. So that is tip number two. I just allow the meltdown. The thing that I've placed at number three on my list is rest and I wrote that rest should be number one but that's not always life but I want it on the list and it seems obvious but here's my take on it it encompasses a lot of things I'm gonna start with sleep I have noticed throughout my life that sometimes I'm feeling very jittery it's like I'm drinking some serious caffeine and there's no caffeine in this beverage and I haven't had any all day but that's what's going on it's keeping my mind focused it's got me jittering so if I'm jittering that's what's going on but I'm doing this video because I feel it's important and I feel like doing something today that's a major victory for me so I'm doing something today I'm sitting here while I'm doing it that's part of my rest actually <laughs> but I'm still gonna start with sleep I've always found in my life that I need more sleep where most people are generally talking about getting eight hours a night as a default 
I don't always need eight hours. It kind of depends. Um, if my sleep is coming smack dab in the dark of regular night where it's starting in the evening, sometimes I wake up super early in the morning, way before the dawn, before the dawn is even ready to get up for the day and start preparing to make her grand appearance. I am already awake off of maybe seven hours of sleep, maybe eight, maybe seven and a half. I've been studying this recently, so these numbers are pretty crisp in my brain. I didn't know I could function off of seven hours of sleep, but I believe that today I got about seven, seven and a half hours, and then I was ready to wake up. It was a miserable experience waking up, but it generally is. I just actually did feel like, hey, now is the time to get up. I'm going to start my day. A good amount of the time, if I'm not going to sleep in the evening or very early night, I might need 11 hours of sleep. I might need 10 or 11, and I'm coming to realize that's not particularly unusual for us Audis. Now, I don't know how that plays into ADHD. That's research I'm going to have to do, because I'm not finding really great information when I'm trying to figure out how to deal with my ADHD brain and sleep. The only thing I'm really running into is people talking about how impossible it is to do so in the first place. But I've got that mix, where Audi brain decides it's time for sleep. Nothing else is going to exist. It's my bedtime. I want to go to sleep. If I need that 11 hours of sleep, I'm going to take it. Society isn't necessarily a friend of admitting that you might need 10 or 11 hours of sleep. I've lived my life with some health issues, so sometimes I have needed way more. I've slept for 18, 22 hours based on what was going on in my body, and I needed it. I can guarantee you if I'm sleeping for something like 18 hours, I desperately need it and my body is having to heal on a cellular little... <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm running into stuff. I've got that step on trash can down there, so I just stepped up it, basically. I got my foot caught, but it didn't hurt. I know I'm needing that sleep very badly, and if it's physical, I feel like a lot of people can understand you just went through something, it hurt your body, you really need to get sleep, and even then they'll encourage you to get it. But when it's an issue of your mental health, when it's an issue of, and I don't mean to suggest that autism or ADHD are mental issues, because I've heard this said, and a lot of people believe that. Um, I've run into people who believe, I'm autistic, now there's something, un you know, there's a thing, there's another thing, there are all these things wrong with me mentally, and it's not mental it is a cerebral condition, kind of like, I don't want to compare it to something ridiculous, but the first thing that popped into my head was liking bananas, or not liking bananas, because I really don't like bananas. My brain is programmed that way. It's just the way I am. It's not because a banana scared me as a child and I was traumatized and I decided I didn't want to have anything to do with anything even slightly banana-like. For the rest of my life. I don't want to eat a banana. <laughs> I just have to clarify that because I've run into it and people have said it to me and I felt like it might have almost sounded like I was about to say autism is a mental issue and it really is not. Um, there's more I could say on that but I'll try to keep it to another video because my mind is going crazy on information right now. What is taking place is that you need to be able to take care of your mental health and whether you're autistic or holistic, the things going on in your day and how they affect your need for sleep in order to regenerate and reset are going to have something to do with your mental health, with your psychological capability to deal with whether or not you are able to ever reset and get out of that burnout I am trying to pointedly talk about today. <laughs> it's that holistic approach to the human being and I feel that I know the experience of having an amount of shame and not even wanting to admit how much I sleep or how much I have slept because it doesn't sound normal and it's put under this category of being hedonistic and just spending your whole day sleeping because you can and I was spending my whole day sleeping because I could if I could because I was broken and I desperately needed to heal on multiple levels. And for me, when it's a burnout situation, I'm very aware that it's the functioning of my mind, it's the health of my brain, and it's the way my body is behaving, my muscles where I hold my tension, 
I'm coming off, uh, I'm, I'm coming off of a three day long migraine right now. And that is because of the level of burnout I was dealing with in my life. So getting that rest is a bigger issue than just deciding I feel like indulging today. This is an issue of fighting the good fight against an early death. Unfortunately, in a world where people say stress is a number one killer and then go into the details of why and how it affects everything in your body and your life, but people also use the term, someone notices something is wrong, they're like, oh no, it's just stress. It's just stress? How can both of these points exist in the same universe or the same brain? You need to get your sleep. This is my suggestion. Um, if you can't get it at night or if you feel like you need it during the day, napping is a good choice if you can get into it. I'm not a huge napper, but I have been napping. Oh boy, have I been napping recently. Oh. Now sometimes naps throw off my schedule, so I have to be prepared when I take a nap to perhaps end up going to sleep even later that night as a result because then I've gotten just enough of a jolt of energy it kind of throws me off and then I have to be prepared to potentially wake up even later the day after that so if you've got a strict schedule or you really just love keeping a strict schedule and it affects you the way it affects me that might be something that you really need to take into account beforehand um, I have put off naps because I know I'm within three or four hours of bed or I just really don't want to throw my whole day off possibly into the next day and the day after that uh, it's just ow oh my gosh I just hit my knee on the desk again that one actually did hurt it's the kind of decision making you need to make in the main in, in the moment based on your day but I'm finding that I'm taking naps more often than I ever really used to and I'm not big on them because they throw me off and because I don't just fall asleep instantaneously so I can't take a 15 minute power nap because 15 minutes might be just my first wash of time laying there waiting until sleep actually comes as a matter of fact I might be laying there for half an hour just trying to turn my brain off enough that I can fall asleep so when I'm napping you gotta understand and when I say it throws my day off I might be taking a five hour chunk of my day out in order to try and take a nap and hoping that the majority of that is going to be sleep we're really hoping that if it's a five hour chunk the huge majority of that is actually sleeping but we'll see other things I'm gonna put in the category of resting just zoning out Sometimes I find myself doing this. Deep breath. I'm not narrating it to myself, but I'm narrating it to you. I just sit back. I close my eyes. I take a deep breath. I let it go. I listen to the quiet. I might have some relaxing music going. I will just take a moment wherever I am. If I can't take it where I am, I might go into a bathroom. If I can't go into a place, like go into my personal space here, I might go into a bathroom around a corner far away I mean I would go across the store whatever to that little nook in the toy section in a store where kids usually aren't so the toy section is generally empty and that is where I'm going to take my moment and I'm going to breathe I'm going to try to bring myself into the moment I'm going to pay attention to me inhaling and me exhaling I'm going to listen to whatever hopefully quiet noise is going on and that's going to start to sound a bit meditative but for me in that moment it's not about a meditative state it's about calming myself down and having a moment where I don't have to talk I don't have to be on and I can just rest where I stand if I'm in a safe place and I know I'm okay then I'll go and let myself slip into any natural form of dissociation that's happening if I'm stressed to where and overloaded to where I need to zone out I call it zoning out I have all of my life I've said dissociation um, you might call it an autistic shutdown I'll let myself go into that place where basically I'm not if I'm really safe I'm not paying attention to my surroundings if I find myself slipping into it and I'm around people and I can't really help it I will try to pay attention to my surroundings as much as I can 
which just means I'm not really letting my brain go as far into that shutdown as it needs to to heal. So it's more like a state of tepid dormancy than actual complete rest. But for me in life, it's about grabbing what you can when you can have it. And what I'm saying here is that you can't always go into a safe room or a clean room like Monk. Personal headcanon, by the way, I'm just saying Monk as autistic. But you can't necessarily go into a clean room like that episode of Monk where he was stressed out. Let's see, city sanitation workers went on strike and everything was a mess outside so he couldn't function. And they brought him into a room that's literally a clean room where everything is white and there's no dust and he could finally breathe. You can't always go into that place and completely zone out. So I'm just telling you how I do it. If I can at all contain it so that I'm aware of myself. Sometimes that's not always going to be possible. And I've had experiences where I couldn't be aware of myself, but I was so overwhelmed. And I just, personally, thank God for taking care of me because it's not always safe to just be out there like a bunny in the wild, you know, a little white snow bunny sitting in the middle of the desert whilst everything goes by. You might be in the middle of a road in a desert and a Mack truck goes by. You don't want to be that tiny like, you know, that, that tiny white bunny in the middle of the street searching for snow and unable to see or hear anything around. So, God have mercy on me. Sometimes I haven't been able to pay attention, but when I can, I'll just go into a state of dissociation because I need the rest desperately. So that's that's pretty much going to be, I think, as much as I want to talk about the concept of resting. And I'm just making it realistic because, like I said, you can't always go into a clean room. Other things that rest me, listening to music, if it's something calming. And sometimes... I need to get the energy out so I'm not dissociating, but I'm just playing the music that's high energy and that does work to get the energy out. But right here, I'm talking about it in the form of letting go. So I'm not thinking about high energy stuff that I love that helps me. I'm thinking about really lower energy stuff that's calming, things like a peaceful frequency. I will find myself some nice music with a relaxing, healing frequency. That is something I do. It's something I believe in. People say, oh, frequency is bunko, it's not out there, it doesn't exist, but they grew up listening to radios. Have you ever heard the term radio frequency? Tune into the right frequency? How do you think that music that you grew up listening to, or those newscasts or radio shows, or I don't know, War of the Worlds if you were there for it, how do you think that got into that little box? Magical men from Mars? Something like it. Frequency. So anyway, you don't have to believe in that. I'm just saying I kind of have to. I'm a bit science-minded and I know it exists and I know it makes a difference. As a matter of fact, if you want to believe, or if you want to believe, if you want to get a concept of whether or not science is accepting that frequency makes a difference, I don't know exactly what term to put in, but you can do some searching into um, medical establishments bringing in cats to work with patients to work with patients. The cats put on glasses and lab coats and they start taking notes, but the cats are doing their job because they're coming in and interacting with the patients and it's not just that they're calming because Oh, hold on. A truck is going by or a car or something. I was so busy talking I didn't even realize. Hold on. Maybe I'll edit this out. It'll be so funny if I don't edit this out. Now it's hilarious, now I'm wondering if I'm gonna edit it out. So the point is, they're not bringing the cats in because they're a pet and it's relaxing and it's comforting entirely. That's gotta be a point of it. The point is that the cat's purr has been shown to help ease patient pain. And the cat's purr is doing this because it's vibrating at a particular frequency. So if you want to get some ideas into how slowly but surely science is catching up to some of these beliefs that some people have held for centuries, you can go take a look at that and see if you believe that a frequency might be scientifically provable as actual medical treatment. So I kind of swear by this to get into the right, right relaxing field. Obviously you can't just pull, for me, I can't just pull any old frequency. I've got to like the music itself because you can have the same one going, the same frequency, and just 
not be feeling the music that's been made to it. So once I find some music where I really like that music and I know I've got that frequency going on underneath it and in the background, that's really great for me and that's very restful. So I'm also finding that journaling is helping and I've always been a writer and I got into this world where I got my first smartphone. I put it off forever. Finally got my first smartphone and it happened to coincide with um, end 2019, beginning 2020. So a lot of stuff was going on in the world and I didn't necessarily have the time or the energy especially at the beginning, to be thinking about pens and paper and what I didn't ha did and didn't have to clean. But I had my phone, and my phone was waterproof or water resistant anyway, so you can swipe your phone down with antiseptic all the time and it was just with me. The next thing I know I ended up taking notes on it all the time. That year, 2020 happened to be so busy for me that I didn't really have time to pull out paper so before I know it, I w I'm taking planner notes in my phone and everything just became jumbled. I actually ended up backing up a bunch of planner notes. And while I was in the process of backing them up, somehow a bunch of them got erased. So that was a really good reminder for me that I like a nice closed circuit piece of paper for my lifetime memories. Although the file I got rid of, I don't know might have been an energetic thing. I might have needed to get rid of it because something really, really bad had happened in my life. It ruined a relationship I thought would never get ruined. And I was really scared in the moments when it was happening. So while I still have documentation of it in other places, I lost all of those notes I had been taken, taking. And maybe that's something that I needed to do for me so that I would never go back over them and trigger myself like crazy reading them. Nonetheless, the experience, whether it was ultimately a good thing or not, might have ultimately been a good thing in another way because it really spurned me to get back to my paper planning. And more and more since 2020 began, it's been less planning for me than it has truly been journaling my day after the fact because just the format of my life has changed and yeah, I'm spending a lot more time indoors. Everything's different. So I'm journaling a lot and that's very therapeutic for me. And I have gotten, I'll end up showing this journal in another video by the way because I'm excited about it and I like it. And I just want to show this kind of thing. But as a glimpse, it's this, I'm going to try to pronounce this, forgive me, Luchtern some lines a day journal and it's got just the tiniest bit of paper for writing in each and every day so I don't really get to go buck wild so you're gonna have this and it's just gonna have this amount of space between those lines for that one day so it's not a lot of space but it's helping me really be pointed about my thoughts and my feelings without rambling and um, that's something I'm prone to do and I don't say rambling in a negativistic way but it's definitely the first and only word that's popping into my head right now for what I do, and I know I do it, so that's really helping. And there's something about being pointed about your feelings and experiences of the day, and having space for what really stands out, and helping you to think about what you want to see. When I'm journaling on, let's say I'm recording this on November 15th, today, whatever I write on November 15th, I'm going to be 2022. I'm going to be thinking about what I want to read next year on November 15th, 2023, when I'm filling in that day underneath that slot and I can easily look at what I wrote today. What am I really going to want to remember? What's going to be that important to me? So I'm going to put journaling in there as resting because for me it's very restful and that's probably going to close out my category on the subject of rest. Number four on my list is indulge your desires. So I put rest on there because I was being funny with myself. My desire tends to be to rest, but I've already covered rest, so I'm going to skip on to the next things. Okay, I wrote down stuff like comfort foods. Now, I'm a little bit unusual for me. Comfort food might be a big bowl of green beans steamed with salt and pepper and butter because that's what I like. 
but comfort food might also be i mean this is a classic macaroni and cheese or whatever happens to be happening uh yesterday i was thrilled out of my mind because i didn't have to cook or come up with something to eat because food had already been presented to me and part of what was presented was macaroni and cheese i did have to tweak it a little bit but once it was tweaked it was pretty good so i was into it but whatever your comfort food might be whether it's a bowl of green beans or some pasta with cheese maybe more people would relate to that one i don't know who's to say that's one of the things that i would personally be indulging you got to do what's healthy so other things that i have written down for indulgence i also like to do some yoga and some stretching and i basically just call it yoga when I have the energy to do something that might be strenuous or take a minute and stretching when it's just literally getting up out of my chair and doing like this if you heard that that is my left shoulder sometimes my body pops when I move it <laughs> Holding a lot of stress in your body is a known thing. I'm a person who will hold that stress in my body. I'm a singer. I really don't want it going to my throat. But sometimes I'm sitting there realizing, wow, that experience I just had 30 seconds ago seems to have just gone right in here. Clamped me up to the point where I can barely speak. So that's fun. I'll do some stretches for that. You know, I'll roll my neck around try to relax that's a big one I used to do all of the time both directions I've been doing it all of my life so it doesn't feel like a danger to me and I'm mindful of what feels that way but if you're going to decide you're going to roll and stretch your neck for the first time in your life exercise great caution because you have no idea <laughs> I've been doing it all of my life when I haven't done it in a while, sometimes I will feel like all of a sudden I get to this point around here and all the muscles in that part of my neck just go or I'll feel like I just hit a stopping point, like there's a break. I can roll my neck this far and then all of a sudden I can't move it any further. You do not want to injure yourself. We want to take care of our necks. But I'm saying, for me, that's one of those things I enjoy doing yoga and stretching it's not like that's not something i try to do on a regular basis however often in the lead up to a burnout we don't have time to take care of ourselves properly which might have something to do with one of the steps leading to the burnout so it's something where i mindfully and i have to mindfully do this try to bring it back because this feels good to me it feels good to my body um, I know everybody's going to think of indulgences as being something like, fine, go ahead and have that drink. Well, personally, I don't drink and I don't smoke. So when I'm making my list of things to do to feel better or take care of myself, I'm probably not going to think to mention it. I thought to mention it today. I don't know why, because it's not something that I do. So it's not going to make it onto my list of things that I want to do. And if I did, for instance, decide I wanted to have something i wouldn't be smoking anyway it's a personal thing but if i wanted to do the other thing if i wanted to have a drink of some nature i don't know that i put it on my list of indulgences for taking care of myself in a burnout because i'm so mindful in my own life of how that can go very easily from being relaxing to something else but it i don't if that's the last time you ever hear me mention it it's literally just because it's not something i'm ever really thinking about so my indulgences might sound a little odd I wrote down personal time, top five things to do as an autistic and or ADHD adult. So if I need some personal time, <laughs> once again, might not have the time for this when I am in the process of being completely burnt out and freaked out. But I am going to be your traditionally named feminist and I am a very specific type of person and I am science minded and you don't have any idea what kind of chemical cocktail your brain can release to bring down tension. There's my phone charger in my way. <sighs> it's going to be one of those days where I hit everything, just run into everything all the time. That's really nice. I'm suffering from hardcore ADHD today. I'm everywhere. Move the phone charger. It doesn't matter. It'll be something else in a minute, so it doesn't matter if I move the phone charger. But what I'm trying to say is, I am very aware of the extreme strength of my brain to release a magnificent natural chemical cocktail of stress and anxiety release to make my muscles stop being like and just go into that state and to just relieve pain and relieve stress and relieve tension and then there's that specific kind of tension that it relieves so that is 
high on my list of things to remember in life. You know, sometimes things fall where they may, and it's another thing that doesn't necessarily get done as often as I believe it healthfully should be done, or as much as I want, but that's on the list. And here's where we're making a video for those of us who are not going to fall into the realm of how to deal with a five-year-old, you know, from the outside perspective, how do I deal with my five-year-old? This is me, as a human being, late in my 30s or early in my teens, I haven't decided, it depends on the day, dealing with burnout. So, number four, indulge desires. So, <laughs> some of my desires are to express myself artistically and to video game. And I mentioned video gaming under the category of resting because that's something that helps me rest and it's a place where I can get into a dissociative state. But it also falls into indulging desires because sometimes I get caught up in doing other things. I'm getting much better at this in life, but the nature of me throughout life has been to get caught up doing other things. To fall into that toxic productivity lifestyle, not because it's my nature, but because I grew up in that society and it affected me. So it's an issue of your self-worth. You need to be toxically productive or why do you exist, you know? I'm not that mindset. I consider actually being okay to be a pretty important part of living life. But nonetheless, I am still healing myself from trying to work constantly, non-stop, constantly going at whatever my mission is just to prove to myself that I'm okay and that I lived this day or that I was worthy of this day so sometimes I need to give myself permission to play a video game. Even when I'm so blasted out from stress and exhaustion and already having spent my day's focus and used all of my spoons, there's our terminology. It's been rattling around in my head, it was gonna come out in a video sometime. Once I've already used all of the day's spoons, sometimes I need to remind myself to be healed and act healed as I know I am and I've been healing more and make a choice that's good for me and do something that's going to be playful that's going to indulge a desire because I love gaming do something that's going to rest me because I can rest when I'm playing a game and while I'm doing that I might be in the process of also cutting people off because how can you play a video game properly if people are in your face and frankly I might be having a silent meltdown while I'm playing the video game because sometimes I'll just find myself falling apart crying releasing my energy while it's happening or even just staring at the screen while the screen while the game is up not so much playing but mousing around the lot you know just looking at things sometimes it just helps me to focus my eyes on something so I can release my energy and let whatever needs to come out actually come out of me in a healthy way and a safe environment because that's how I like to let these things do it's how I have survived all of the things whenever I was capable I got to a safe place in order to be the me who is really me, even when no one else can see, especially when no one else can see. So while I'm doing that, I might actually be indulging thing number five that's going to come up on my list, which I'll get to, but it's, it's, like, it's like a meditative and opening act because, you know, I'm playing that video game and I'm opening myself up in that way and I can let any thoughts and any memories and any things I'm studying any things I'm ruminating over just come into me so that might actually hit you don't know you might be able to combine for me I'm realizing as I sit here and speak video gaming kinda hits things number one two three four and five on the list so since I've said that I'm gonna go ahead and move into thing number five thing number five is spirituality I am a very spiritual person just by nature all this stuff is very natural to me I feel that when I am personally challenged to my very peak of tolerance to the very depths of what I can take that subject matter becomes even more important to me my approach to it is okay I'm a Christian and my approach is neither going to be traditionally Christian nor is it going to be traditionally anything else because I'm me and I'm unique. So I'm not going to say I take huge solace in reading the Bible because I have to and it's the thing to say because that does not always bring me solace. That's a lot of work. There are many words. I'm thinking about stuff like translations and how many times it's been transliterated or whatever the term is and what's left in it. It's a big subject for me. And what I'm reading 
is a big subject. It might be relaxing or it might be triggering. So that's not going to be at the top of my list of things to do. What I will do is I will go into places where I'm meditating, I'm relaxing, I'm focusing. Prayer will work in there. Prayer will work with meditation. I will light a candle and I will take a moment to look at the flame. I'm running into everything today. I'll take a moment to look at the flame because I just, I love the elements and I'm really into the fire. It's beautiful. <laughs> that doesn't sound disturbing at all, but it's true. I like the flame. I think it's gorgeous. I like the science behind it. I like all of the energy within it. It's a great place to focus my energy to look at something that's got as much energy as whatever might be going on. <clears throat> Excuse me, whatever might be challenging me. I'm trying to figure out what else falls into this category. I definitely find myself researching spirituality a lot, and I've never been a person who stays within my own lane, so to speak. So I tend to have spent, I've spent my entire life researching everybody's spirituality. I always say I like to know a little bit of something about everything. I, I like to know something about everything. And I don't know how I would make my own choices with my belief system if I didn't know about other people's choices with their belief systems and what's out there. So for me, in my path at Christianity, I might be studying things that people don't think fit into that at all. I want to know what other people's lives are like, why they believe what they believe, why they've chosen, and I've been spending a huge amount of time delving back into that. And it's been hugely restful and relaxing for me recently because that was something that had lost all joy for me. And now I'm getting that joy back. And the level of information out there these days with the internet and everybody having a platform, you can learn everything from everyone. And you've got to take it with a grain of salt like you should take me. I know I'm being sincere when I'm talking, but you are you. And you don't even know whether I'm being sincere when I say I know I'm being sincere. So you've got to listen to me and use your own judgment and your own instincts. I will always encourage that. I encourage that with my friends and everybody, every relationship. I'm in, especially these days, you will hear me tell you who I am, and then I will tell you, use your instincts, because I'm a fan of people using their instincts. If your instincts are healthy, once again, I'm making a suggestion. If you know that your instincts aren't doing you well, then you're going to have to do what you know is best. <laughs> but in general, for humanity, I'm a fan of using those instincts. And one iteration of using those instincts for me is to go back to what comforts me, to what feeds me, and often what's feeding me is doing some research into stuff like spirituality or whatever is going on in the world, listening to other people. So weirdly, research is kind of restful for me inside of the category of spirituality because I just love getting into that kind of zoned out place where I can go look it up. And I can get into that and I feel like they call it what it's not a great term but I think they're calling it autistic inertia where I kind of get stuck in it and can't really get out so I was getting stuck in researching all of these different levels of spirituality and everything and metaphysics and I'm into quantum physics and all of these things so I'm going back to that love that I had and I had lost these things earlier in my life for multiple reasons and they're coming back so I'm very aware of how powerful they are right now because I've just come out of a large trek of my life where I did not have them and I'm very grateful to have them back and that is seeing to myself spiritually. It is helping me to focus on what's important to me, to see what I have a connection with, to take care of all aspects of myself and address myself holistically as a whole being. So whatever that might mean for you, as long as it's a positive thing for you and you're harming not yourself nor any other being, because I'm never okay with that personally, that's what I'm going to suggest. As thing number five on the list, take care of yourself spiritually. I also want to just state that as a point of taking care of yourself spiritually, sometimes we end up eliminating ourselves from the groove in our daily life because we're trying to take care of everybody else. Some autists will not have as much effective empathy. Some autists will have more. I'm the person who has more and I was taught a lot of empathy so I'm going to speak from that standpoint because it's the only one from which I can speak. I had so much understanding for everybody else's issues in life that perhaps I managed to eliminate my own 
because I was so busy feeling for everyone else. I was raised Christian, which is a lot of love and a lot of love for your fellow woman and your neighbor. And I was raised female. Modern studies are showing that autists excel at effective empathy, which means actually feeling what someone else is going through, whether or not you choose to admit that they are happening, by the way. And I was taught a huge amount of empathy and care for others and thought about what others were thinking. I was taught way too much of that to be someone who had it so very acutely, so very naturally. This affected my life, and I ended up eliminating myself from my life because I considered my life to be an adjunct to everybody else's life in the entire universe, with me just being the only individual worthy of sort of eliminating from every room and every situation. So I put everyone else first, and that affected me on every level, including spiritually, because there is a point when I would say to myself, God, why did you create me? Was it because I literally created just to be a receptacle for everybody else's pain? That's a huge subject, and I'm not going to get into that today, but it leads into the concept of perhaps some of us as neurodivergent individuals very naturally eliminating ourselves from every room and every conversation and every situation and eliminating our hearts from our own lives because our brains are telling us that everyone else is important and our hearts are feeling that everyone else is important and possibly in pain. So we elevate them and we try to care for them and eliminate ourselves. When I did that, it harmed me spiritually. And I have listened to a lot of people who have done that and it has harmed them spiritually. And whatever is going on in your life, whether it's that or some other thing, I want you to take a moment to access, to access, to assess whether you have been harmed spiritually, if you are a person of faith, has it harmed your faith? If you are a person of altruistic beliefs, has it kind of tapped away at your altruistic belief system until you start to find less value when you get into those moments and you find less value in everyone else because you're really admitting to yourself in a passion what has been done or what you've experienced or what the outcome has been of how you're treating yourself just consider care for spirituality as a part of your burnout recovery because it's such a huge portion of who we are as beings and for the people who who focus on that it's going to be so consciously such a huge part of our lives that if you're not seeing to that i don't know how you're going to recover from anything let alone something as overwhelming and devastating as being in burnout so that is my list of top five things that I actually practically do on a daily basis. And I, I've tried to give some actual examples of how it worked because it's not that easy. You can't just throw out a handful of five things that you need to get done in somebody's life. It's not easy for anybody. It's not going to be that easy for NTs. We've seen that. They talk about their lives. We've got their psychology in endless manuals. We know it's not easy for anybody. But for those of us who are ND, neurodivergent, wow, it is really not that easy. So I just want to give suggestions, give some of my experiences, and that's what I've done. So you've got a list of things to consider in your own life. And I'm hoping and I'm betting now that I think about it, some of them are going to apply to you, if not all. So tell me what you're thinking about what you do to deal with your burnouts in the comments and really consider what you can do to take care of yourself in any way that you can because I want you to take care of you and I want me to take care of me and I'm really sitting here being corny wanting the world to be a better place and I want us to be better and I want us to heal ourselves and I want us to focus on healing ourselves because historically I'm not sure how many people have really been doing it even when maybe they think they are or maybe they hope to be. And unfortunately and sadly, because of information, etc., I include us on that list. 
from my own experience, among others, but man, from my own experience. I hope that this list helps get that done a little bit and fill that gap because, again, I was always looking for actual things I could do, practical things I could do, and I could never find it. So here it is in a video. I think I have said everything I need to say in spades. I am tired, I am jittery, and I need fresh tea. So that's about it. Bye now. Hey ho, Avi the vlogger here. <laughs> I'm just gonna hit record and see what happens. And I'll open my video like Kermit the Frog and hope Miss Piggy doesn't find me because I don't think she's gonna be into that. I don't think she'd be into that any more than I would be into that. She might be a little more demonstrative about it. So what I'm trying to say, meltdown maintenance. I'm gonna edit this video. I was hoping I could just sit down and do one and done, but honey, meltdown maintenance. That's not even what I'm trying to say. Burnout maintenance. Right. All right, I might write this down as a video concept. I have a little list here. Changed my battery. I'm coming off of a multi-day migraine. I'm so happy. I'm so blessed and free. Where's my pen? Where's my happy, blessed, and free pen? Hold on. Where is my pen? No, this is not funny. Where's my pen? Where is my actual pen? No, dude, hold on. Yeah, that's a lot of talking on that subject. Who knows what I might end up cutting? Let me take a break and breathe. Let me mix my tea. I got buttered tea. I'm gonna whip it up. Cause all I can see is butter and what I need to be seeing is chocolate. I'm gonna butter my tea or my coffee. I'm gonna have my whisk do. It's gonna be in my hand at all times. I'm whisking this stuff like crazy. The stir constantly joke from friends that tried to give up Central Perk and they're like, we're gonna mix this coffee ourselves. It says stir constantly. So you have to stir and drink and stir and sip and stir and sip. No, that's me. That's me when there's butter in this stuff. I'm not gonna just drink three inches of, it's not three inches, oh my heavens, but I'm not gonna drink three inches of butter off the top of my drink. Mm. Uh-huh. Dude, there's lightly sugared chocolate in my mouth and it's buttery and it is good and spicy. I love it. <laughs> It wasn't that good the last time I tasted it. The nutmeg must have opened up. Hi ho, Avi the vlogger here. <laughs> and I was raised female. Well, clucker of rice. There it is again. That's a lot of noise. Ha, huh. I was saying, I... What? Are you actually kidding me? Well, at least you're sexy and sweet and might roll out of here within the next 60 seconds. I'm gonna start over. Hi ho, it's Avi the vlogger here. <laughs> I can't. It's too funny. <laughs> do it straight and just keep it. I'm gonna do it straight. <clears throat> Let's try this again. Let's see. Because I kind of just went on the subject of what happens with burnout and burnout recovery. Maybe I'm talking about burnout recovery. This is a video I have sought many times myself and couldn't find, so I guess I'm here to make it.